Hi, welcome to International Hawaii on ThinkTech, where we showcase local import and export companies and the trade in industry. I'm your host, Cindy Matsuki, and today we're chatting with Brad Watanabe of B Rad Studio. Thank you so much for joining me, Brad. Thanks for having me. <laughs> How's it going, everybody? We are awesome. So yeah. B Rad Studio, is that is that from your name? The the name of the company? <laughs> Uh, it is, it is, uh, B-Rad is a nickname that I picked up back in high school, kind of picked it back up again in college and stuck with it. But, nice. I yeah, like it's, it. it's a play on my name, but it's also kind of a play on the idea of just to be rad, you know, mm-hmm. to be special, to be different and, and go out there and make some noise. Nice. I love it. Um, so could you briefly explain what your company is and how you got started? And when did you start? When did you start the business? Sure. Um, well, I've actually been doing production for a long time. Started in LA uh, after I graduated school. So been in the industry in some way for about 20 years now. Wow. Um, moved back to Hawaii in the end of 2006 and worked my way through um, doing some things for advertising agencies and that kind of thing. And then started the Red Studio technically about 10 years ago or maybe close to 11 years ago, but really took it full time. Um, about seven, seven, eight years ago. Uh, we make we make documentary style content, um, marketing content, specifically driven at helping brands tell their story. Um, and we do things for social media. We do things for broadcast. We've done things for in theater, uh, on planes, all, all kinds of things uh, that revolve around video and, and story. Uh, that's, that's what B-Red Studio does. Um, and that's what we love doing. Nice. What was um, the biggest hurdle when you were starting up your business? Um, I think when you work in a creative industry, there's a lot of doubt um, mm. because it's a very subjective mm-hmm. industry. You don't know mm-hmm. whether or not your art is good. You don't know whether or not the message you're telling is is going to be right for business. Mm-hmm. And, and so you never or you never really actually get over that in some ways. Uh, the idea that you could be um, wrong, and and it's it's also this very like personal um, divulging of like something internal that you're sharing with the world, and and so I think artists always struggle a little bit with that. So um, breaking out from like working for a company who had like that that part of the um, I guess the what is the right word the the onus for the actual final product, you know, I could just be an artist and work for them. And like, it, it would be their responsibility <laughs> to make sure it was right for a client. Mm-hmm. When, when you start to build your own thing, it's all on you. Mm-hmm. Um, so taking that responsibility for the creative side, the financial side, and, and the rest of it, I think that was the biggest struggle. Mm, and especially when you start hiring people, then you have like people depending on you too, right? That's yeah, tough. yeah. We have other mouths to feed on top of my my wife and now my son. So, yeah, hey. there's there's a lot of other people that rely on on us to to keep mm-hmm. keep it going. And I love your tagline, meaningful storytelling, and your videos do re- a really great job of doing that. Um, and so I can see how it can get very personal on both sides, like your yours and the client side, where they're kind of mm-hmm. giving of themselves too, and you want to represent that well. Um, who is, who's your target market and how do you market yourselves to this, this audience? Uh, we've worked with everyone from like the state, um, the department, uh, like DLNR, DOFA, we've worked with nonprofits, we've worked with really mm-hmm. small startups, but we also work with big corporations, um, like the Airbnbs and the Hawaiian airlines and, you know, big hotel conglomerates, all of those types of things. So the way that we and the marketing is determined on um, which type of project we're going after at a specific time. Um, but a lot of the time, there's there's kind of this weird gap between what people want to sell and how they want the world to view them. Um, so we, we, we kind of uh, differentiate that between sales and marketing or sales and brand. And we end up being more on the brand side than mm-hmm. on the sales side. 
Mm-hmm. And, and so that's where story, I think, is the most impactful is when you're trying to build your brand, when you're trying mm-hmm. to let people know who you are, what you stand for, what your values are. And um, that's how we've we've built our particular story, whether that's through Instagram or the YouTube things that we do. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always trying to tell our story in a way that invites people into our our life, uh, our production life. Um, our creative process, all of those things, so that they can in turn see how we might do that for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's not a hard sell, like, hey, we're the cheapest production company around and we'll <laughs> give you these many assets for this many dollars, because that goes back to like the sales side of things. Mm-hmm. Um, so when we approach how we want to be known, um, what kind of stories we want to tell, we also have to let people know that we know how to tell our own story in that way. Um, so we, we go that route um, with a lot mm-hmm. of our brand and marketing. Nice. And then the brand, I think the brand storytelling is longer lasting too, as far as, Mm -hmm. you know, when the company can use it, like, it seems like it's something that would always be valuable. And then I wanted, yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go for it. I wanted to let our viewers know that you are an FTZ9 tenant. And so (laughs) I wanted to, I wanted to ask you if you could explain like, why you're here and how you work with, like how you are in the international trade industry. Sure. Um, I, I've told some people um, through me and, and I think you that I actually worked on a project here when the Homer Maxi building was being built. Um, I was doing a project for Kiwit when this whole building was actually still in, in build, building mode. So I saw it before the floors were laid and all that stuff. Um, so in some ways, it's it's actually uh, really, really interesting to be in here now as, as a tenant, as somebody mm-hmm. who gets to, to utilize this property. Um, but it's it's been it's been great for us to, to have a space kind of right at the edge of downtown and Kakako, where things mm-hmm. happen in the business and in the creative sectors, right on the edge of the water. And so that that part of it, location has been amazing. Um, and not not to toot your horn, but I'm gonna I'm gonna do it. But you guys have been awesome. The the entire FTZ9 family has been great <laughs> too, as landlords, but also as like extended family. Um, uh-huh. And even even in just getting us in here uh, was, I mean, when, when you're looking for property in Honolulu. Mm-hmm. It's it's not easy to find something that's going to fit you, fit your budget, fit your mm-hmm. location needs, your fit your client needs. And so when we found this place, I was like, I I don't know, can can we make this work? Because I was coming from a place where I'm working out of my home, you know, out of our loft, mm. into like the first time getting a space. So mm-hmm. even in that transition of does this make sense um, from mm-hmm. a financial perspective to to make this move? Mm-hmm. Um, but when it came to like some of the international stuff, uh, we've, we've actually been making a lot of international video content for clients for, uh, yeah, for the last, I think eight years, um, right. whether that's commercial projects that, that live in, in Japan or in Australia and, or in New Zealand or in Korea, um, we've been thinking about creative in, in these international places for, for a while. And so it was, it was actually a really interesting fit. And for me to actually be able to see some of the other international business that goes on here, it also helps me um, from a creative perspective and, and also just from a business perspective to see what else is out there um, and how to help other people build their brand and, and build their network. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. How do you, I would imagine from Hawaii, how do you find international clients? Um, well, I think, I think that one of my first clients, um, has, has a lot to do with that. Uh, so from, from the beginning, right when I started b studio, one of my first clients, when I left the agency world, uh, was Hawaiian airlines. And they're still mm-hmm. a very, uh, important part of b studio's story today. We do a lot mm-hmm. of work with them. And, and as you know, they fly everywhere. Uh, they fly all over the world now. And mm-hmm. we were there when they first started some of their their international routes. So in in helping them market and brand and tell stories in all of these other spaces, it's also helped us to get eyeballs 
from agencies from around the world as well. Hmm. Um, we've also done work with like the Boy Tourism Japan um, group and, and done documentary work with them. We've also done work with uh, Agu Ramen, who actually, hmm. uh, you know, became a big, a big part of our growth uh, a few years back. And we went out to Japan with them and just to see ramen process and, and tell some stories with some amazing ukulele players. Um, we've, we've had some really amazing experiences traveling the world. And I think there, there's that saying, uh, the best way to get a girlfriend is to have a girlfriend. Um, <laughs> and, and when you have clients that are doing that kind of thing, it also gets you the visibility of other people that want to do that mm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, so just by proximity, you know, being like doing a lot of work in Japan for some of these other clients has also helped us bring in work from those places. And I think there's also this interesting um, closeness that you have to have with travel to start to do that at a at a commercial level, um, because when you when you start to understand how international content works and and audiences work it's also easier for a client to trust you than with their international storytelling. Um, hmm. And then, you know, doing, doing all of the, the back end stuff, um, the travel, the, the lodging, all, all of those other things, it, it's just easier once you kind of are already in a system where mm. you know how to do all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So sometimes yeah. it's also just ease of ease of working with somebody who's done that before. Mm -hmm. That's true. Because that can get complicated. <laughs> yeah. Do you find that storytelling is an international, like it's the same everywhere? Like just the way you tell a story is processed the same way? Um, I was actually on a mission trip in Japan, I think, back in 2008. And one of the gals that we met along the way actually told us that media and story is super duper important for Japanese people to hear. Yeah. There, there's something about when they see it in video format, whether that's on a TV or on just somewhere on a screen mm -hmm. where they actually think of that information differently than when they see it on in like in print or yeah. like on a on a poster or something. And so I that that always stuck with me that video and story have a different type of um, avenue into people's like hearts. Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. I, I feel like in, in that regard, because you are playing with more, more senses, you have sound, you have sight, you have all of these different types of things, these visceral um, connections into people's lives mm -hmm. that the video story world uh, is, is just a really, really powerful medium just across the world. But I do feel like different people around the world also receive that information in a different way. Mm -hmm. And we've learned that a lot through like our some of our work with with Hawaiian that our our content for Australia is very different than our content for um Japan and not just Japan but like Hokkaido is different than Tokyo which is different than really? Kyoto. Huh. Yeah. Um because different people react to different things. Mm. Um and like even uh when we were doing some work with Halikulani Hotel because a lot of their guests are from Japan mm -hmm. like one of their big um one of, one of their big like visual cues that they would always tell us was important for anything whether whether it was photo or, or video was blue sky because huh. in japan like specifically in tokyo you see a lot of high rises a lot of buildings mm. so um part of that is just like feeling and seeing air um, we don't huh. think about that here because we see yeah. a lot of sky we see a lot of blue and, and that's mm -hmm. just commonplace but even in Australia, it's it's a different kind of a psychology because they see that. Um, in New Zealand, they see outdoors. Um, and so the way that you market to them is is very, very different. The, the types of stories that you're going to tell are very, very different than what you might do in Korea or in Beijing or in, in Tokyo. Oh, wow. So it's really good when the client knows what they want to promote to their customer. Or, you most know, how most they definitely. Yeah, interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a question in from a viewer. 
Oh. It says social media has been leaning towards short video formats. Do you think you can tell a meaningful story in 15 seconds? It's really short. <laughs> um, one, of the, one of the commercials I go back to in every presentation I give uh, was a Super Bowl ad almost 20 years ago. And it was a kid who walked out um, into a kitchen and eventually uh, turned on a Volkswagen by using the force. And <laughs> there was, you know, there was no, there was no dialogue. Um, it was a super simple commercial with a really powerful message. Um, but that commercial in, it, it could have been in 15 seconds. Mm. Uh, it didn't need to even play out in, in 30 seconds. But yeah, I feel like if, if you have a really powerful concept, you can do that in three seconds. You can do that in 15 seconds easily. Um, mm. But it's much, much harder now in social media because there's just so much more noise. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about whether or not you have a good video. It's about whether or not you can actually reach your target audience. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not just about that one 15 second video. Now it's about the 15 second video that you put up every single week or every every other day yeah. that becomes your brand. It's, it's not just that one video anymore that, you know, that, that Volkswagen commercial that might've been, you know, a half a million dollar commercial back in the day for that 30 seconds for that airtime and all, all of that other stuff. Um, and so that, that had to build brand in it of itself. And now we're using hundreds and hundreds of content pieces through photo, through 15 seconds, through 30 seconds, through three minute videos, mm -hmm. um, which all are now building marketing and brand together. Wow. And so is that something you guys do too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, we, we've actually done a lot of work for Olukai. Olukai mm. is the, the shoe slipper brand. And I feel like they're one of the brands right now that does it really, really well. Mm. They do a lot of product-based stuff. They do a lot of lifestyle things and they really have embraced the short form story. Um, mm. Every new feature that pops on Instagram, whether that's reels or um, the, I don't know, as soon as a new feature comes up, they're, they're in there trying to use it because they know that that's going to get them visibility. It's going to get them audience that they need to sell their product, but they do it natively in that, that format. Um, and a lot yeah. of people in the traditional world run away from some of these like new trending styles of communication because they're like that's not going to work that's too short that's <laughs> you know wh whatever it is but the truth is i mean there there's definitely an art in being able to craft something in 15 seconds or mm -hmm. in like multiple 15 second rolls mm -hmm. yeah. and yeah that's it's it's the new new way of communication yeah and i feel like that's how consumers are in taking content now and yeah it's just where you have to be it's where you have to be yep it's <laughs> what you have to what you have to make and i mean the the part that we struggle with on our end just cuz it's not what what we do um there is this department in most traditional advertising agencies called media mm -hmm. and they're the people who determine whether or not your your thing your ad goes in the newspaper goes in a you know magazine it goes on a billboard it goes in radio it goes in in tv mm -hmm. Uh, and that department now gets jumbled into something that we call social media. It's the digital mm -hmm. version of that. So where does your ad get placed? Is it on Facebook ads? Is it on Instagram ads? Is it going to be mm -hmm. on Twitter? Uh, do you have something on like iHeartRadio uh, as an ad versus like on local, um, mm -hmm. you know, radio or something like that? But it's 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 kind of taking what the traditional media department used to do and still does. Um, mm -hmm. and, and packages that for, for this audience. So it's, it's as much about making amazing visual content, telling amazing stories as it is about actually getting that amazing content to your intended audience. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you have a secret to good storytelling if you're willing to share? <laughs> um, I honestly think it comes from a lot of good research first mm. um, because it's hard to go into like any situation where somebody is going to divulge personal information, whether it's about their business or about their, their history, mm -hmm. uh, about their family without actually doing diligence 
to research what where their story is and you know if if you kind of expect them just to answer questions that's usually a an easy way to get very rigid responses uh, but if you want to get something that's impactful and meaningful and and deep you definitely have to do some research mm-hmm. so it feels like you're starting the conversation um, from like at least a, a week's worth of like relationship mm-hmm. if you like the first time you meet somebody you're never really going to get very deep mm-hmm. um, maybe after after a few months or something you start mm-hmm. to get that get get a little bit more permission mm-hmm. to to hear some of those stories yeah but it, it's it's building trust uh with somebody so they know that you're going to do right by their story mm-hmm. it's um doing doing that research so that they can trust you mm-hmm. and um then it's it's just really really good listening mm, and asking because questions. a lot of a lot of yeah, a lot of the questions actually come through the conversation mm-hmm. um, and, and they get formed in, in real time in some ways. Mm-hmm. And you can have a great list of questions, but uh, the best stories come from the best listeners, I think, um, mm. because because you can actually pull out stuff that uh, where, where a conversation should be going rather mm-hmm. than where you previously intended it to go. Mm-hmm. And then editing is super important because people often don't say exactly what they meant. So it's your job as as a storyteller, not just to um, try to change what what it is they they actually said, but your your goal is to actually try to get them to say in the edit what you know they meant. Mm. And and that's a really interesting um, and and very special part of what we do. Uh, People hate the edit process because it's really really hard and but that's that's yeah. where the magic actually yeah. happens yeah um and and as you do that more and more people start to trust that you're gonna mm. again you're gonna do right by their story um mm-hmm. and then you'll get more permission from more people to do that for them mm. got it interesting that's it sounds like it takes a lot of skill and a lot of practice definitely <sighs> a lot of practice. <laughs> out of practice um just because we're sort of so we're in tier four now yay has the pandemic affected your business and if so did you have to make any changes or were you still able to keep going yeah um interestingly enough uh during the pandemic we had our first son uh so that changed a lot of of life (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Thank you. Um, but that that also made me just rethink and, and reprioritize what mm-hmm. I would do for business. Mm-hmm. Um, so in a lot of ways, the pandemic uh, just situationally changed life for me. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that was a good thing. It also made me just reevaluate what was important in, in the business structure um, and, and the types of clients we wanted to continue to, to work with and maintain. Um, and and honestly, I mean, I think just like everybody else, financially, we we took you know we we took some hits, but at the same time, we also realized that um, coming out of it, people would need our help more than ever mm. because mm-hmm. there are businesses who are struggling, who or yeah. who just limped out of of COVID and are on on the brink, on the cusp of potentially um, not being in business anymore. Mm-hmm. And so our goal is not to help them like market a, a product or try to sell something cheap because that's that's a, a quick way, a, you know, they, they say it's a race to the bottom when you try to sell things too deep, but it's to actually help them understand who they are, what they do, more than just what they sell. Mm-hmm. Um, Simon Sinek is famous for saying, you know, people don't buy what you make, um, they buy why you make it. Um, mm-hmm. And that's that's a big reason why people are are faithful fans of certain brands, certain products for their entire life is because they believe in the why of business, the why mm-hmm. of the, you know everything that company stands for are more than just this is another thing um, that I can buy. Mm-hmm. So our, our goal is to help brands like invest in that and build build on top of that rather than just trying to be another service who's selling a thing. Mm-hmm. And and more than ever, I feel like those types of of story-driven brand content um, uh, pieces will 
will definitely rise above um, other things because there's just, again, there's just so much messaging. There's so much noise. There's so much stuff out there to, that definitely. wants to consume our attention. Uh, the depth I think is, is more valuable than, than ever. Mm -hmm. A good way to cut through everything. Mm -hmm. Nice. Yeah. Um, as we're slowly wrapping up, what advice would you give to someone who is also thinking about exporting services to different countries based on your experience? Um, sure. Even though we're, we live in this really global world and people have different needs, people have different audiences, all of that stuff. Um, it's, it's really important to understand your own story so that you can then share that with, with everybody else, kind of coming back to that, just that brand message. Um, when you're, when you're exporting a good, it's, it's really easy to get stuck in the, the product. Um, mm -hmm. And there's so many products out there, but I think people, people will love you if they get to know you, if they get to, to understand who you are and they get to know you as, as good people mm -hmm. rather than just a, a good product. Um, and that's why you see more and more storytelling now than, than ever on, on social, even on um, traditional mediums Like you see more intentional, personal storytelling. And I think, I think that goes to show uh, what people are also buying more of um, mm -hmm. or investing in is, mm -hmm. is that personal brand that they can believe in and love. Mm -hmm. And I think before when we were talking about how now with everything on the internet, everything is like all content is global, no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so everything, it it. everything can be seen and consumed <laughs> around the world. Exactly. So I can see how if you can tell a good story, then already you're marketing yourself globally. Yeah. And, mm. and a great story transcends language, culture, all of those things. And one last question, random question. And there, uh, there were so many other questions that I didn't get to, but <laughs> maybe for another show. Um, last quick question. Go. What is your favorite restaurant that you've been supporting? Favorite restaurant? You love to eat at? Yeah. <laughs> this is the random closing question. Oh, man. Random <laughs> closing question. Oh, that, that's, that's hard. Um, because yeah. we haven't actually gone to that many restaurants. Um, just because we have true. a young one, we, we've kind of stayed in and just That's true. ordered. Uh, um, we loved Mitch's for sushi. We love Zippy's for like quick takeout. Um, MW, mm. uh, love, love Wade and Michelle. They're good people. Um, so many great local chefs and business owners that we've gotten to know through some of our other work that um, I, I always try to give a shout out to. Nice. Um, nice. You start looking for all the family friendly restaurants now. <laughs> yeah yeah it's such a different different mindset but that's so fun though congratulations exciting thank you <laughs> yeah very cool okay we're gonna have to leave it there you've been watching international okay. hawaii on think tech hawaii and today we've been chatting with brad watanabe of b rad studio thank you for sharing your time with me brad thanks for having me <laughs> and thanks to our viewers for tuning in i'm cindy matsuki and we'll be back in two weeks with another edition of International Hawaii. Thanks for joining us. See you next time.